Hello, people. <coughs> can you hear me? Please put a thumbs up if you can hear me. Hi. Hi, everyone. Let's start a session directly. First question, what is CRISPR? What is the answer? A, B, C, D. D option was not available by many of the students. I had asked many people but they didn't have it. If you have it, please send me the answer. This is past Jipma question. What is the first answer? What is CRISPR? B, B is not the right answer, Arjun Raj. C, A, okay, all the answers are here. Okay, look at this. What is the full form of CRISPR? It is clustered, regularly, interspaced, short palindromic repeats. I repeat, it's clustered. <coughs> it's clustered, many are present together. And these kind of clusters are present at regular spaces and they are very short in size and they are palindromes for example i have a a a t a a you can have a a t a a that can be written backwards also so they can have palindromic repeats and these crispr initially began with the concept of prokaryotes mark my words the palindromes were present initially in the prokaryotes what do you mean by that especially in case of rk bacteria in case of archaea bacteria and other kinds of bacteria, you had CRISPR. What was the function of CRISPR? They were present in bacteria and these sequences are derived from the DNA fragments of bacteriophages that had previously infected the prokaryotes. Now what is the point here? You will be looking at CRISPR that are present inside the bacteria but they were acquired from evolutionary basis they were acquired from bacteriophages. What compounds are, what kind of substances are bacteriophages? Remember, all bacteriophages are DNA viruses. I want you to know that bacteriophages are DNA viruses. In the exam, they'll ask you whether they are DNA or RNA or mutant varieties. They are not mutant varieties. They are just viruses capable of having DNA in them. <coughs> they are capable of having DNA in them. And these DNA are the ones who will be present inside the virus structure they'll be infecting other bacteria now when a bacteria has been infected by a new dna the bacterial dna will mix with the viral dna and they'll produce a hybrid that hybrid fragments can actually start moving from one place to other it can be taken up by other bacteria also now these kind of bacteriophage sequences crispr sequences are capable of cutting and editing the other DNA present in certain kind of bacteria. What exactly is the purpose? Look at this. These CRISPR are used to detect and destroy DNA from similar bacteriophages during subsequent infections. Now I hope you would have heard about a concept called as interferon. What are interferons? They are nothing but antiviral host proteins. What exactly is the function? Imagine this is cell 1, cell 2, cell 3, cell 4, when a virus from outside comes and hits the first cell, this first cell is like cramped. Now please remember, any virus when it attracts any cell, if the virus is virulent, then that cell can be destroyed. There is no, <coughs> there is no other go than to have a cell destroyed. When the cell is destroyed and when the cell dies, before dying, that particular cell will write a love letter. It writes a love letter. That love letter will be given to other kinds of cells. 
So this love letter goes to other kinds of cells. All the other cells will read the love letter. They'll understand what exactly was the tragedy that hit the particular cell. Then the cell will tell everything about the virus. It'll write, this was the virus who came and attacked me. And this is the property of the virus. This was the genetic information of the virus. This was the mechanism used by the virus. All these data will be given to the subsequently present kind of cells. Now these cells will learn about this information about the virus. They'll become slightly more resistant to the infection by the virus. Now, CRISPR also has the same kind of activity. These sequences are derived from the DNA fragments of bacteriophages that had previously infected the prokaryotes. So when a particular virus enters into the bacteria and comes out, it will carry some information about the bacteria also. Now this bacteriophage goes and attacks another bacteria. This information goes to another bacteria also. With the help of a virus, the CRISPR sequence will enter into the bacteria. Now the bacteria will use the CRISPR sequence to fight against further bacterial infections. Now look at the question here. It is a type of defense mechanism in virus. That is absolutely wrong. Bacteriophage is not capable of using the CRISPR. Bacteriophage cannot use the CRISPR. But bacteriophage can transfer the CRISPR. Transfer the CRISPR to the next kind of prokaryotes. So it is not against bacterial infections. It is a type of bacterial defense mechanism in bacteria against the phages or viruses. Please put a thumbs up if you are okay with this information. I will go forward. If you have any question also, you can ask me. Okay, what is the extra information you have to know? Now look at this. There is something called as caspase 9 or Cas9. This Cas9 uses CRISPR sequences. The combination will be referred to as CRISPR-Cas9 complex. I'll write it here. It will be called as CRISPR-Cas9 complex. Now this Cas9 will use CRISPR. That CRISPR will help in the guiding, guiding to recognize and cleave specific strands of DNA that are complementary to the CRISPR sequence. Now, just give me a minute. I'll use another kind of slideshow. I'll use an extra slide. writing stuff, I'm just using this slide. Okay, what am I saying? Cas9 is a protein that will bind with CRISPR. What is CRISPR? It is clustered repeat interferences sequences, right? So, they are sequences of nucleotides and bases. Sequences of bases. Now, using the sequences of bases, these sequences of bases will guide the protein called as Cas9. So, that Cas9 will go and attack specific zones on, attack specific zones on target DNA. Now, it can have multiple results. Either if I want to go back and edit a particular DNA, I can do it. I can edit an RNA that can be done. I can destroy a DNA completely because of which a viral infection can be nullified. For example, if a virus comes into the cell and that virus has dependency on a particular DNA, if that DNA is specifically destroyed by the CRISPR, that CRISPR destruction was actually based on the Cas9. Cas9 is the weapon, CRISPR is the brain. Using CRISPR guidance, Cas9 can attack specific zones of DNA. Look at the theory here. Cas9 enzymes together with CRISPR sequence form the basis of a technology known as CRISPR Cas9 that uses to edit genes within the organism. This editing process has. <coughs> I'm sorry. 
This editing process has a wide variety of applications including basic biological research, development of biotechnology products and treatment of diseases. So if I want to destroy a particular DNA, if I want to alter a DNA, if I want to alter an RNA, then I can use the information of CRISPR and the weapon called as Cas9. Both the guidance and the weapon together can cause the modifications. Now let's go for the next question. Effect in familial hypercholesterolemia. What is your answer? You can go for it. You can say anything you feel like. <laughs> Saram says A, Akshara says B, Arjun Raj says A. Anybody else with an answer? <clears throat> okay, so that tells us where the misunderstanding happens. Now I want you to watch very carefully about what I am trying to tell you. I am going to use this. I am going to tell you some basics in understanding the fatty acid metabolism. Mark my words. We have a concept called as lipoproteins. These lipoproteins can be named as either compound lipids or they can be taken as compound proteins. Why? See, if I have a protein binding with a protein, it's a homogeneous structure. If I have a lipid binding with a lipid, that is also a homogeneous structure. But when I interfere with the lipid by adding a non-lipid component, then lipid plus non-lipid will be called as a compound lipid, which is lipoprotein, where protein is the non-lipid component. If I take any kind of simple protein, if to a simple protein I add a non-proteinaceous component, that non-proteinaceous component here is called as lipid, that is what is called as lipoprotein. So when I divide the lipoprotein, I will get lipids on one side, and the non-lipids called as apoproteins on the other side. Depending upon the concentration of lipids and the apoproteins, we have different types of lipoproteins. Point number one, we have lipoproteins, right? Now, there are certain rules I wanted to understand. Lipid concentration is directly proportional to the size of the lipoprotein. Why? Lipids are low in weight, more in size. Also remember, lipids are directly proportional to size but they are inversely proportional to density. So if in a lipoprotein, if the lipid component is more, it will be less dense. If the protein component is more, it will be more dense. Depending upon the density, we divide all the lipoproteins into multiple types. The beginning is chylomicron. Next, we have VLDL. Then we have LDL, IDL. Then we have HDL. So from here to here, the density is increasing. So mark my words, chylomicron is the least dense, while HDL is the most dense. Also remember, density is inversely proportional to size. So if I say chylomicrons are the biggest, then they are the least dense. HDL is the most dense, then these means these are the smallest molecules. I hope you have understood this part. I'll use another slideshow here. Now look at this. They asked about familial hyperproteinemia or lipoproteinemia. Look at the question here. The question was about defect in familial hypercholesterolemia. According to Fredrickson's classification, we have type 1, type 2A, 2B, 3, 4 and 5. What is the beauty of 1 and 5? In 1 and 5, triglycerides are elevated. In case of 2, you have cholesterol elevating. Cholesterol elevating. Now, what is this classification referred to as? Fredrickson's classification. Fredrickson's classification. Now, Harrison's is doing away with the concept of Fredrickson's classification. It is not used anymore. Now, Harrison's has only three major classification. They call it as hyper triglyceridemia. Opposite of the hyper triglyceridemia is hyper cholesterolemia. And in between you have mixed 
is lipidemia. These are the three major classification according to Harrison right now. But till the 17th and 18th edition of Harrison, we started having Fredrickson's classification. Even in many kind of biochemistry books, we have the Fredrickson's classification. Now what is type 1? Type 1 is familial hyperchylomicronemia. <coughs> And remember, from the previous slide, I told you, chylomicrons are the biggest in size, but the smallest in case of density. And chylomicrons are made up of, mark my words, chylomicrons are made up of 90% triacylglycerol. And who is the next VLDL? VLDL is made up of 60% triacylglycerol. And what is triacylglycerol? Lipid component. So in chylomicron, it's like a balloon filled up with a lot of cotton. It has a lot of gas. So the size is bigger, but the density is smaller. Chylomicron is based on lipid component and VLDL is also based on lipid component. Now look at the other kind of chylomicron, the other kind of lipoproteins. LDL is mostly made up of cholesterol. Now all these things can annoy you if you don't understand what is the meaning of lipid first place. I'll write it here. Watch very carefully. Who are all contributing to the concept of lipids? Free fatty acids are lipids. Glycerol will help in the formation of lipids. Triacylglycerol is a combination of both. Then cholesterol is lipid. Cholesterol with fatty acids called as cholesterol ester is also a lipid. Phospholipids are also lipids. So in a lipoprotein, lipids are these while the proteins are referred to as apo proteins and apoproteins can be A, B, C and they can have 1, 2, 3, they can have A, B, C, A, B, C etc. We can have C, 2, 3 and 1 etc. So we have apoproteins on one side contributing to the protein component, lipids on the other side contributing to the lipid component of lipoproteins. So in this, if the triglyceride is elevated, then that is chylomicron or VLDL. If cholesterol and cholesterol ester is elevated, it is LDL. Now, some people chose lipoprotein lipase as the answer. Lipoprotein lipase will always act on triglycerides or triacylglycerol. So, when lipoprotein lipase is deficient, which lipoprotein will be elevated? <coughs> you tell me. I have told you all these. I am saying lipoprotein lipase will act on triacylglycerol or triglycerides. So triacylglycerol and triglycerides are present in certain kind of lipoproteins. Tell me, if LPL is defective, then triglycerides are not broken down. If triglycerides are not broken down, which lipoprotein will be elevated? I am saying triglycerides are elevating. It means which lipoproteins are elevated? Triglyceride is a lipid. Excellent. Either the chylomicrons or VLDL. Now what do I tell you about the Fredrickson's classification? Type 1 is familial hyperchylomicronemia. While type 5 will have VLDL elevation. Type 3 and 4 are mixed dyslipidemias. It can be a combination of many. While type 2A is specifically for cholesterol. And what happens in case of cholesterol? Look at this part here. You have LDL who handles cholesterol. Now, if the cholesterol is going to the tissues, it is done by LDL. While from tissues, cholesterol are traveling to the liver, it is done by HDL. But liver will also have receptors for LDL. They are called as LDL receptor. Now, if the LDL receptors are defective, then LDL will not be able to enter into the liver because of which LDL will be floating in the circulation. So increased LDL can happen in case of your LDL receptor defect. Also remember, when LDL is increasing, what is technically increasing? I said LDL is filled with cholesterol, right? So cholesterol levels also increase. So cholesterol increase, LDL increase is the property of type 2A, hyperlipoproteinemia. So we'll come back to the question here. Look at the question. <coughs> Defect in familial hypercholesterolemia means type 2A in that LDL receptor is defective. Lipoprotein lipase defect means you will be having chylomicron elevation 
or you will be having VLDL elevation. Increase in HDL is not even a problem, but it can be taken as a good thing. Defect in OE will be seen in case of Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease. Okay, now we will go for the next question. In which step of PCA cycle ATP is generated? Go for it. Excellent Harish Gautam, Soham Pahuja, Pradeep Raj, Bhuvana Karnanadi, Ranjit Kumar, Shakti Vailji, Arjun Raj, Kennedy Singh, Swati, Kennedy Singh, Jake Kumar Pillai, all of you have given me the right answer, Saram Shagarwal, amazing, amazing, Soham Pahuja, Saram Shagarwal, yes, what is the answer here? A. Succinate Dehydrogenase, no, Arjun Raj is the closest, excellent Arjun Raj, now look at what I am writing here. I'll just tell you the TCA cycle for a minute. Watch carefully. We start with acetyl-CoA. This will react with oxaloacetate coming through the TCA cycle. Both will become citrate. They will become cis-aconitate. Then they will become isocitrate. Isocitrate with the help of the enzyme isocitrate dehydrogenase will become alpha-ketoglutarate. Alpha ketoglutarate, okay, I'm so sorry. I'll use a different part of the board here because I'm covering the board here. We start with acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA will react with oxaloacetate to form citrate. Citrate will undergo isomerism to form cis-aconitate. Cis-aconitate will become isocitrate. The isocitrate will actually become alpha ketoglutarate with the help of isocitrate dehydrogenase, this is present in mitochondria. Remember, isocitrate dehydrogenase has two isoforms. One is cytoplasmic form, the other one is mitochondrial form. And what is the function of this? This dehydrogenase, just like pyruvate dehydrogenase and alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, can help in not only dehydrogenase activity, they can also help in decarboxylation activity. Decarboxylation means removal of carbon dioxide. So, when I start with isocitrate, it is a 6 carbon compound. On becoming decarboxylated, it becomes a 5 carbon compound called as alpha ketoglutarate. Now, this alpha ketoglutarate will become succinyl CoA, and the enzyme is an alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. This alpha ketoglutarate also will cause, dehydrogenase also can cause decarboxylation. Now, that succinyl CoA will become succinate. And that succinate will become fumarate. Fumarate will become oxaloacetate. The cycle continues. Now here I want you to understand the cytoplasmic isocitrate dehydrogenase will use NADH. While, I mean, the cytoplasmic isocitrate dehydrogenase will be using NADPH. While mitochondrial will be using NADH. When I speak about TCA cycle, TCA cycle is mostly mitochondrial. So this is isocitrate dehydrogenase of mitochondria which is not having anything to do with NADH. But the cytoplasmic isocitrate dehydrogenase is an important pathway for producing NADPH. For your kind information, NADPH has three major sources. One is HM patient, the second one is cytoplasmic version of isocitrate dehydrogenase, the third one is malic enzyme. So here this is mitochondrial isocitrate dehydrogenase which will deal with NADH and not NADPH. Here when the succinyl CoA is broken down by succinyl thiokinase, an ATP will be generated. Now I'll use a different slideshow. Just listen to me for a minute. See, <coughs> we have succinyl CoA. That on the action of succinyl thiokinase enzyme, the thio bond can be broken. What is thio bond? Yes, H bond is called as thio bond. Now, how do you write the active form of pantothenic acid? Pantothenic acid is a B-complex vitamin. The active form of pantothenic acid is coenzyme A. That coenzyme A is written as CoA with an SH. Now, when I bring any kind of acid, for example, RCOOH near the SH group of COA, then both of them will lose a water molecule in such a way, I will have RCO 
with an SCOA, which is a high energy bond. This is called as acyl CoA. Now, I am saying succinyl CoA is losing the CoA so that it becomes succinic acid. Succinic acid. Now, I want you to use this logic. Thio involves the breakdown of the sulfur bond present here. Then, this kinase is important for transferring the phosphate. So, it means if I bring a GDP here, it becomes GTP. Do you know what is the name for this formation of ATP? What is this phenomenon called as ATP formation or GTP formation from the mitochondria here? Excellent Arjun Raj, yes it is correct, thiol bond. I am asking you, what is this formation of ATP called as? Excellent Susan Mahmohan, it is called as substrate level phosphorylation. Mark my words, there is a concept called as substrate level phosphorylation. For MBBA students, still PG aspirants, you have to know the three steps of whole of carbohydrate metabolism where you come across the substrate level phosphorylation. Point number one. 1,3-bisphosphoglyceric acid becomes 3-phosphoglyceric acid where if I throw an ADP, one of the phosphates will become ATP. The next one is phosphoenol pyruvate becoming pyruvate. The phospho part of the phosphoenol pyruvate will actually give out another kind of ATP. The next step is succinyl-CoA becoming succinic acid where I throw in GDP, it comes out as GTP. So please mark my words, these all are important for MCQs in Jitmer, PJ Chandigarh and NEET. So there are three steps in the whole of carbohydrate metabolism where you'll expect substrate level phosphorylation. That is, in glycolysis we have three steps. In glycolysis, when 1,3-bisphosphoglyceric acid becomes 3-phosphoglyceric acid, when phosphoenol pyruvate becomes pyruvate, and in case of TCA cycle, when succinyl CoA becomes succinic acid, an ATP or a GTP or an ATP equivalent is generated. How will you define substrate level phosphorylation? That is, an ATP or a GTP generation happens without entering into electron transport chain. Without involvement of electron transport chain, if ATP or GTP is involved, that is called as substrate level phosphorylation. Why am I teaching you this? In this question, they are asking you in which step of TCA cycle ATP is generated. It's a classical example of substrate level phosphorylation. It happens at the level of succinate thiokinase. Okay, the time is 1 o'clock. It is exactly 29 minutes up. Are you okay for one more question? No, no. You don't call it as succinase. You call it as succinate thiokinase. But you have one more enzyme called as succinate dehydrogenase. That is the one that converts succinate into fumarate. Okay. Shall we go for one more question if you have time? <laughs> Excellent. All of you are knowing about substrate level phosphorylation. Excellent. So, glucose 6-phosphatase and other such enzymes. Okay, what about glucose 6-phosphatase? You have a very valid question. Look at this. See, if I write about glucose 6-phosphatase, it means a glucose 6-phosphate is becoming glucose. Here, the phosphate is lost as inorganic phosphate. Here, I will not have an ADP coming back and getting the pi to form ATP. So, I will not form ATP in this process. It is just knocking off of inorganic phosphate. That inorganic phosphate will enter into the cell and it can be used up in some other pathway. But there is no part by which an ATP is formed in this area. So, glucose 6-phosphatase is not an example of substrate level phosphorylation because when I use the word substrate level phosphorylation, the phosphate who has been knocked off from the substrate should be trapped as a high energy compound either as ATP or GTP, CTP, TTP or UTP. Did you get my point, Avinash Mukherjee? <clears throat> okay.
Okay, the last question for the day. A baby is hypotonic. A baby is hypotonic and shows elevated pyruvate. Look at this. Elevated pyruvate to lactate ratio. Pyruvate is to lactate ratio is elevated. Either lactate is less or pyruvate is more. Now, our culture of fibroblasts and examining the culture cells, pyruvate fails to become acetylcholine. It means what? I start with pyruvate. Pyruvate is CH3, C double bond O, CO, OH. This pyruvate is supposed to become acetyl-CoA. What is acetyl-CoA? It is CH3, C double bond O, yes, COA. It means I have to throw in a co-ash. I'll be getting only hydrogen back. But I'll also be throwing a lot of cofactors. And the enzyme complex is a PDH enzyme complex. Mark my words, in this particular question, pyruvate is becoming acetyl-CoA, right? So here, what is the chemical reaction you have to know? A pyruvate is trying to become acetyl-CoA. Pyruvate is becoming acetyl-CoA. And the enzyme involved is a PDH enzyme. This is a enzyme complex. Enzyme complex would mean to say that it contains three enzymes. Mark my words, the complex contains three enzymes and five co-enzymes. The enzymes are pyruvate dehydrogenase itself. The header name pyruvate dehydrogenase itself. It also has something called as dihydrolipoyl transacetylase. Transacetylase. It also has dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase. So the question here is in the PDH complex we have two dehydrogenases, one transacetylases, and we have five coenzymes or vitamins. Who are the five vitamins we have in case of PDH complex? I'll write it here. The first vitamin is B1 in the form of thiamine pyrophosphate. The next is coenzyme A which is pantothenic acid because you know right pyruvate is just an acid but the pyruvate became acetyl CoA. The CoA is a tail. So coenzyme ASH is the coenzyme which is from pantothenic acid. Next for the reduction reaction you will require NAD which is niacin and you will be using also FAD which is riboflavin and ultimately you will be having lipoamide in the form of lipoic acid. So we have 5 vitamins and 3 enzymes. So I hope you understand. If the PDH complex is not functioning properly, any of the enzyme may be defective or any of the coenzyme may be defective. So when I give pyridoxin, useless. When I give biotin, useless. When I give free fatty acid, useless. But when I give thiamine, it can help because thiamine's active form is thiamine pyrophosphate. It is one of the important coenzymes of pyridox of pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So if there is lactic acidosis, then you can expect TPP to help the people. Did you understand this? Excellent Avinash Mukherjee. Biotin. The function of biotin is biotin helps in addition of carbon dioxide. Pyridoxine helps in removal of carbon dioxide. Free fatty acids are uncouplers of oxidative phosphorylation. Mark my words. Free fatty acids are uncouplers of oxidative phosphorylation. If they are lesser in content. Lesser amount of free fatty acids can be uncouplers of oxidative phosphorylation. While when the pyruvate is not becoming acetyl-CoA, then pyruvate can become lactate. But pyruvate content is more than lactate. Still lactic acidosis is seen. This is a case of PDH complex defect. Are you okay with this information? Excellent. Now look at this. So, when it comes to metabolic pathways, what are the things that you have to know? When you want to answer questions in metabolism, first read metabolic pathways. Read metabolic pathways. Then read about rate limiting enzymes. Whenever you read the enzyme, read about the coenzymes and cofactors. If I come and ask you what is the first step of glycolysis? What is the answer? Glucose becomes glucose 6 phosphate. Who is the enzyme? Hexokinase. But you can't stop there. Who is the cofactor? ATP will become ADP plus inorganic phosphate. 
this inorganic fossil go to glucose to form glucose 6 phosphate is it complete no it is still not complete you have to say magnesium or manganese are important now every single element who is supposed to be here will have its own unique action why because magnesium handles phosphate so when the phosphate is coming out of ATP that phosphate will be captured by the magnesium and will be offered to the glucose so the glucose becomes glucose 6 phosphate so in case of magnesium deficiency or manganese deficiency glycolysis can be lethargic the people can always become faster tired they can be fatigued they can be lethargic so if there is asking questions you have to understand the meaning of the involvement of every single part of the cofactor so every time I write a chemical reaction it can be complete only when you write the whole reaction with the substrates and products with the enzymes the coenzymes and the conditions acidic or alkaline all these things alone can fetch you the full marks in biochemical statements remember now at 7 pm tonight we'll be having a session on the remaining parts of inborn errors of metabolism for those people who have unacademy app please join me on the unacademy app at 7 pm and you can follow me on unacademy by searching for my name as meenakshi sundaram as now tomorrow Tomorrow at 12.30 p.m. sharp, again we'll have the same session. We'll have the continuation of this particular session. For those people who have sat with me till now, thank you very much. For the next 30 seconds, I'll sit with you if you have any questions to ask. So, thank you very much for being with me. Tomorrow, 12.30 p.m. on YouTube. Tonight, 7 p.m. on the Unacademy app. See you. Bye. Have a good day.